Hello plant lovers, it is Matthew in Melbourne welcoming you back to my channel. Thank you very much for finding me. And if you're new, I grow cold, cool, intermediate orchids here in Melbourne, Australia, without a greenhouse or grow lights or humidifiers. They're just indoors or they're outdoors or they're out of the pool. So if that sounds like your conditions, do hit subscribe. I post every week about my very amateur ramblings through the world of growing orchids. And today, plant lovers, surrounded as I am by many different plants, perhaps you could guess what's going on. Yes, I am so excited to be doing a collaborative orchid video with Rachel of Gardening in Duenza. Now, as I'm sure you all know, Rachel's channel is called Gardening in Duenza and Rachel's garden is based in Wexford in Ireland, but she also grows orchids brilliantly, both indoors on windowsills and then outdoors in a greenhouse and sometimes in and out summer winter indoors and when i began my orchid journey and i was looking on youtube for videos rachel's was the first channel i stumbled across because weirdly although rachel's in ireland i'm in australia our growing conditions are not that dissimilar and i didn't have specialist equipment and i wanted to basically grow orchids either indoors on windowsills essentially or outdoors undercover sort of in a version of a greenhouse and rachel's growing conditions were very similar to mine and as it was quite difficult to find information about growing orchids for me in my climate here in Melbourne, I just binged watched all of your videos. So Rachel, thank you, because it's kind of your fault that I got somewhat addicted to orchids in the first place. But that is why I am very excited that Rachel and I are collaborating today. And this video is gonna be each of our top five orchids that we grow. So at the end of this video, there'll be a link to Rachel's video and you can go and see her top five orchids and what I might have to say about them. And in this video, I will be talking about my top five and Rachel will be talking about her thoughts on mine as well. I will link Rachel's channel below and also at the end of this video. And Rachel's a great horticulturalist and her garden in Wexford is open to the public at various times in the year. So if you were lucky enough to be in Ireland and nearby, I would hot foot it down there and have a look. And I, Rachel, cannot wait to have the chance to come to Ireland and meet you in person and maybe do an on-the-spot orchid club. But anyway, I digress. Thank you, Rachel, for participating in this collaborative video. And without further ado, I am going to reveal to you what my fifth favorite orchid is. Now, asterisk, I have to put a caveat over all of this because I feel like I'd be disloyal if I just chose five out of the many orchids that I have. So what I've decided to do is make my top five orchids that I can grow outdoors all year under cover, but essentially that just do their own thing with pretty minimal intervention, otherwise known as lazy orchid growing. Hello, Matthew and Matthew subscribers. I'm Rachel from Duenza Garden in Ireland, and I'm very pleased to be joining with you, Matthew, on this collab video on our top five orchids. Oh my goodness top five such a really heartbreaking and difficult decision to make but we got there in the end now i'm also deeply honored to hear you say that you found my orchid video so useful when you were starting out on your journey in growing orchids and i want to point out as well that you're not an amateur anymore it, there may have been a point when you were starting that journey but given the extent of the plants that you grow now the different varieties and the amazing flowerings you've had oh my gosh the flowering of your delicatum it's to die for stop calling yourself an amateur you're not that anymore at all now, like you, I like to grow orchids with a minimum of fuss, ones that don't kill me in the process. And I tend to grow them on the windowsills in my house, cattleyas on south facing windows, like the ones you see in front of me. They aren't normally positioned out here in the garden at all. What I really love about your videos, Matthew, is the stylish way in which you display your plants in the house. And I think as one progresses with this hobby, it's very easy to lose sight of why we grow houseplants in the first place. We grow them to enhance our living space and to, I guess, assist in our well-being as well. But as you get 
more progressively into the hobby very often those plants tend to dominate and take over and even be a bit oppressive at times and I'm very happy to see that you haven't lost sight of what's important you have that balance just down to a T. Okay well without further ado I'd absolutely love to hear what your fifth favourite orchid is. And so to reveal number five of my top five orchids that I grow outdoors all year in cool conditions, I am with the magic of television going to move the camera back and reveal that it is right here. Ta-da! Dendrobium delicatum. And as you might be able to see, Rachel, this is a beast of a plant and it is so enormous. I don't think I'm really ever going to be able to move it again until I have to move. But here it is, Dendrobium delicatum. Now, let us just consult the Bible of Australian native orchids, which is Orchids of Australia by W.H. Nichols. And open it to the page of Dendrobium delicatum, and it will tell us that it is a naturally occurring hybrid between Dendrobium speciosum and Dendrobium kingianum. Now, both of those are Australian native orchids, and this one naturally occurred in a part of the country which is a bit further north to me. So I'm here in Melbourne, and as you can see, this orchid comes from parts of Queensland and northern New South Wales, which is a lot warmer and subtropical than me. But for some reason, Delicatum simply loves Melbourne, and you might see it's a little moist because this is outdoors all year and it's actually not particularly undercover. It gets rained on, it gets sun, it gets whatever gets thrown at it and here we are. Actually Rachel, thank you for making me get it out of its nook because I've just realized there's a few little housekeeping things to do. So these are the spent flower spikes. The delicatum will bloom from the apex of these spikes right in the middle there but, and I'll find an example to show you, the flower spikes can also emerge from just below the leaf axis further down the cane. So two spots where this can bloom. And you might just be able to see that some of the buds have already started to appear. The thing about both Speciosum, Delicatum and Kingianum are that they need winter sun and that is the clincher for growing them successfully. And I feel that's perhaps why they often don't work for people perhaps in the Northern Hemisphere growing them indoors. I know people can have a difficult time getting um, Delicatum to bloom. So the trick is where this plant grows, the sun is much lower in winter. So it gets more light penetration, even though the forests around it are not deciduous because they're eucalypt forest. If you imagine the sun is higher in summer, so it gets much more dappled protected light and in winter it's lower quite harsh direct light and I've seen these growing in exposed conditions in direct light. The leaves are really yellow, burnt to a cinder but they're still alive and they're still blooming. So depending where you are in the country, if you're further north the blooming season is earlier, further south like me here in Melbourne it's a bit later. So these can start to bloom in winter all the way through to early spring depending where you are and mine tends to bloom in early spring here in Australia. And really care-wise Nothing. Perhaps in summer, if it's been particularly dry, I'll squirt the hose at it. In spring, I'll give it quite a hurl of a slow release fertilizer pellet. Now, normally with my orchids, I just put a sprinkle, but with this one, it's more like a teaspoonful because it's such a boisterous plant. The other thing too, is it's quite a big specimen. So I am really happy that this orchid is happy outdoors all year, because basically I just treat it like a tub specimen you would use on a patio or a balcony or a terrace. It just sits on a pedestal, so it's slightly elevated. It drains well, but it gets rained on and it gets sun. It also gets cold winter minimum. So our minimum can go down to about five degrees centigrade, about 42, 43 degrees Fahrenheit winter nighttime minimums, sometimes a little bit colder. We rarely freeze here in Melbourne. And although this comes from a warmer part of the country, it seems to manage them. Conversely, of course, it can certainly take hot temperatures. The only thing is, if it gets a lot of direct sun at the peak of the day, you are going to get leaf burn. And I actually don't have any because I look after mine so well. So I have noticed that Dendrobium kingianum and Dendrobium delicatum will produce cakeys if they're not getting enough direct light and or they're getting too much moisture. And in fact, I did see a cakey on this one, which perhaps isn't such a bad thing, I can grow it on. But 
the place where this orchid was has started to get a bit shadier so I've hacked everything back that was around it to give it more sun which is perhaps why I had that cakey. I'm going to slide in some footage of this in bloom. It is a mound of the most beautiful arching sprays of flowers which are a very very pale sort of lilac-y white and they have the most delicious fragrance. It is a sight to behold when it's in bloom. So Rachel number five Dendrobium delicatum what do you think? Oh my goodness Matthew the size of that plant and the extent of the flowers the number of flowers when it's in bloom it's absolutely gorgeous absolutely to die for love it to bits I do hope you'll remember to link somewhere on this video to that video of yours where you showed the plant in full bloom very interesting that it's an Australian native orchid and I must say that it is one that I have attempted to grow. So I grow a couple of Kingianum hybrids, I suppose most notably Berry Oda, which I don't have anymore, but also the one called Ellen. I never thought to grow them in my greenhouse. Now my greenhouse is the space that gets down to low temperatures in winter. It gets down to five degrees centigrade or 41 Fahrenheit and I always kept my Kingianum in the house but I see now why the Berioda for example was giving me so many cakeys it never stopped and I guess it was down to the fact that the light just wasn't sufficient for it, the light in winter. Ellen, on the other hand, she does quite well. She doesn't flower every year, maybe every second year. So it's not really a, well, an ideal result. But yeah, my goodness, that delicatum, it is fantastic. I do grow Irish native orchids here, but these are ones that I have outdoors in my garden. Yes, I am lucky to be able to grow native orchids, but I guess too, interesting, I guess your Irish native orchids are gonna be terrestrial herbaceous perennials. Be interested to see some of those. I'm gonna to have to Google those now. There is no need to Google those plants. I can show them to you right here. And these are the ones growing in my garden, just coming to the end of their flowering season now. All purple, the ones I grow are all purple in colour and they're terrestrial orchids that add a lot to a border in terms of interest and for anybody who likes plants that are a bit rare then you know they're, they're going to appreciate having them in their garden. But I must say that I do feel outflanked, outmaneuvered in terms of what the Australian native orchids are compared to the Irish native orchids because there really is no comparison in terms of We're scale. up to number four in my top five cool growing orchids that I can grow outdoors with minimum effort, I have to say. And it's kind of a group rather than an individual, but here we are, Mazda Valia. And now I'll slide in some footage of my Mazda Valias that I've had success with. And this one is called Mazda Valia Cochinea Alba Snow Tree crossed with Blanca. And I very cleverly bought another white Mazda Valia, not realizing that they were basically identical. And <laughs> I'll show you the two different flowers. But Mazda Valia, again, just seem to love my Melbourne climate here. So it's a cool growing orchid group, generally. Some of the species can be epiphytes and some of the species are actually terrestrial, but they are generally a higher altitude plant, which means they can take cooler temperatures, but also means that they like that sort of misty, foggy environment. Now, Melbourne is not that misty and foggy and we can have very hot summers, but the two things that people tell you about Mazda Valia is they cannot take hot temperatures and they need to be in quite deep shade or low light. Not what I found. So I've actually found that my Mazda Valias do really well with quite bright, direct early morning sun in summer. Now, not for hours. It's quite beautiful. You know, the early morning rays penetrate and hit them. But I would say at least an hour, sort of around 7 a.m. ish, they're getting direct sunlight. And in winter, they get a little bit of direct afternoon light, which is also extremely gentle and soft. Other than that, it's dappled and indirect light. Second thing is the heat. Now, everyone says that a Mazda Valia is going to show signs of stress if you get high temperatures. But here in Melbourne, our summer maximums can get way up to a 40 degrees centigrade, which is over 100. It's 105, I think, Fahrenheit. Pretty hot. Now, not consistently, and if we do get those highs, they do drop usually within a day or two days, and the nighttime temperature is always cooler. So it's not consistently, 
boiling hot in summer, and mine, which are outdoors where it gets quite warm, sail through it. My Masdevallias tend to flower once in early spring. I'd be very curious to know if anyone gets their Masdevallias to bloom at other times and multiple times during the year. I have seen people say, oh, it's often in bloom. Hmm, not mine. And the only problem I ever have with Masdevallias is, and you can probably see here, you see these leaves, it's insects. Hmm, caterpillars just love them and they go on marauding and it can really damage the leaves, particularly baby caterpillars, which you don't see and they're underneath and they just chomp and sort of turn the leaf into a transparent polka dotty damaged leaf anyway. I'm trying to be more focused on keeping caterpillars off them. But you can see the new growths are really beautiful. Mazavalias don't have pseudobulbs, so they grow all year, which also means they can't dry out because they don't have the capacity to store water like other orchids do. So saying, I don't keep them wringing wet. They're not like a bog orchid, so moistish, let's just say. Not unlike Paphiopedilum. So there we go. Mazavalia, Rachel, is my number four. The Mastervillia really is a good choice because it's unusual in terms of the flower shape, really unusual, and those white blooms, so, so stylish. I love fl white flowers. Now, I've only ever grown one Mastervillia, so my experience is limited, but I can tell you that it flowered at odd times, anywhere from September to, yeah, November, January, February, March, and it really was a good plant. So now you've got me thinking maybe I need to try with them again get one again but I do have one really important tip if you grow Mastervillia and you get pests on it do not try the bleach treatment <laughs> I use the bleach treatment to remove certain pests from my orchids and it involves submerging the plants in a, a dilute solution of bleach it does well on plants with thicker roots like cattleyas, but no, not the Mazdis. That's how my Mastivalia died. So don't try that one at home. The bleach solution, goodness me, Rachel, what are you doing bleaching your Mastivalias? You're gonna to have to explain that a little bit more. But now let us get to number three in the countdown of my top five orchids that I grow outdoors all year that are so easy. And it is something that I have only just discovered and it is the Holcoglossum. I've recently made a video about this one. This is Holcoglossum Kimbalianum, the most beautiful bloom. I'll drop the footage in so you can see what it looks like. Just stunning. And this is just sitting, hanging quite high on the bit of lattice fencing by the side of our house. On a south facing side on one side and the other side, it's relatively protected, but it gets lots of airflow, quite bright indirect light. And I just left it there thinking it's never gonna survive the winter. Ta-da, it did and it bloomed and in fact once again Rachel I'm really glad you've made me pick this orchid up because I should just snip out that spent flower spike so that the plant is looking a little bit neater. So most Holcoglossums come from a specific area which is sort of southern China and northern Laos Thailand, Cambodia, that sort of part of the mountainous border area. And some of the species are only found in southern China, others across a bit of a broader area, and some lower down and warmer, and some higher altitudes and cooler. So it is the higher altitude, cooler Holcoglossums that I found just thrive in Melbourne, even though our winter nighttime minimums are probably a little cooler than they get up in their mountainous natural habitat, seems fine. And this one bloomed for me this year, and I had just assumed that these would be a bit more Vander-like and need to be a bit bigger before they were bloomed. So I am so thrilled. And given that that is where the flower spike emerged, I've got lots of growth here. So yeah, I actually don't know if Holcoglossums, I'm sure they can produce multiple spikes the bigger they get. We shall see. The other great news is that I have a little mini me growing out of here too, which is absolutely thrilling. So my number three, Rachel, is Holcoglossum because they are so easy, they are so beautiful. And what more can I say? Matthew, I'm really glad to see that this collab is encouraging you to manicure your plants. Holcoglossum. Well, this isn't one I have experience of. I have never grown one, so I'm very happy to learn about your experience and your tips and to see your beautiful plants. But I would like to know from you, what is your top tip for growing Holcoglossum? 
Ah, I'm surprised you haven't tried them. I would think they'll do really well in your climate. Um, my top tips would be not one, but actually three. First rule of thumb, I would say, try and hang it high so it gets lots and lots of air movement. Second point would be bright indirect light, almost Vanda-like bright. Third point would be let them dry out reasonably between watering because they're epiphytes that cling to the side of a tree, to the bark. They're not nestled in any leaf mold or any other debris. So when it rains, they take up the water, but it then drains and dries really quickly. And then it rains again. So they're in a very moist climate, but they dry out between each cycle of rain. They're obviously surrounded by sort of misty clouds as well. So I missed mine a lot. But when I water it, I do allow it to dry out. But again, they don't have pseudo bulbs, so it's not something that you want to let dry out, but also not something you want to overwater and keep mushy if that's any help. Anyway, I think you should get a Holger Glossom Rachel, and I look forward to your video about it. Which cunningly brings us to number two in the countdown of my top five orchids that I grow cool here in Melbourne, outdoors all year without any heat or assistance, and that is Sologeny. And in fact, Rachel, it was you that put me onto Sologenies. As I said, I first began my orchid journey watching your videos, and you have quite a few Sologenies, and I was so entranced by the name and the flowers that I thought, hmm, let me investigate. So they were actually one of the first things I bought, and this particular one is a hybrid called Janine Banks. And it just so happens that the second spike of mine has just begun to open. And as you can see, it's a very, very beautiful flower. It hasn't fully opened yet, so you can't really get a sense. But I'll drop in the footage of this one when it was in bloom a month or so ago with its other spike, which in fact is also still <laughs> hanging on. So Rachel, once again, you have encouraged me to do a bit of orchid housekeeping. There we go, Janine. Let me just take out that spent flower spike. So these I try to have as high as possible, so they have as much air movement as possible. A bit more shade than my Holker Glossom favorite number three. I do find the leaves can get very easily burnt if the light's too strong, but still fairly bright indirect light, but not as bright as our previous example. And the other thing I've noticed about Sologenies in my environment is that they do need to be watered quite frequently, even in winter, when I'd normally be quite frightened of having an orchid cold and wet at night in winter during those cold winter nighttime minimums. But the Sologenies do seem to love it. And once again, a lot of the Sologenies I grow are Himalayan, higher altitude, cooler native species, which means they tend to do better with cooler nighttime minimums in winter, and they also love a mist. So this is number two, Sologeny Janine Banks. Ah. Uh. Selogeny, such a beautiful plant. Impossible to spell, but beautiful to grow. And I love the large flowers on your Janine. They're gorgeous. Now, I can't believe I'm actually being blamed for getting you into growing this plant, but it's such a good one. I'm gonna just take that one on the chin. I'm also really glad to hear you say that your Selogeny it takes a lot of moisture even at low temperatures because that has been my experience too and I've had my best success with Selogeny when I grow them in my greenhouse so you're talking about a five degree minimum in winter 41 Fahrenheit and moist at that temperature because as you rightly point out normally this is not what you need to do with any plant keep it moist and cold it's a recipe for a disaster but i've had my best success with selogeny in doing that so thank you for reminding me of that but i do have to tell you that for me selogeny just at the moment is in my bad books because my selogeny flaccida flowered this spring for the first time beautiful beautiful pendulant flowers that hang down but dear lord did that plant reek it was like something had died in the room something had died and somebody had tried to remove it with bleach because it smelt of bleach as well of dead things so 
gorgeous plant but if you are not prepared to put up with that kind of smell i don't recommend it ah <laughs> the stinky selogeny mm, well i don't know mine actually i don't have a stinky one so i don't have flacida so may <laughs> maybe i shouldn't if it's a stinky beast anyway let us go with no further ado to da -da -da, number one in the countdown of my top five orchids that i grow outdoors all year Without that much attention, I have to say, they're just protected from the rain. And it is, ta-da, Miltasia. La, 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 la. Yes, Miltasia is my favorite orchid for growing outdoors all year in my cool conditions here in Melbourne. Because, well, why not? Just look at it. Ah, it is the most extraordinary flower. So firstly, the flowers are really quite big, as you can see. Secondly, really prolific. So I have two spikes that have opened at the moment, and I've got two spikes that are on the way. So probably when these start to turn, the other two will take over. Super easy to care for. Essentially, the orchids that I grow outside, I want to treat as just like a potted tub plant on a terrace or a balcony, or whatever. I don't want any sort of fussy behavior that some orchids can take. And Miltasia is one of those. I kind of just treat it like a pot plant. In summer, I give it a good spray with the hose. There is water all over it. There's water in the leaves. There's water in the leaf joints. It's generally very wet, but it is warm enough ambiently to evaporate and not really cause any problems. And then in winter, I just spot water it with a watering can, but still quite a lot and a little bit sloppily, I must say. But here we are, it produces the most stunning array of blooms. Now I haven't told you which hybrid this is and it's Miltasia Lavender Kiss Lavender Taffy. And plant lovers, before everyone gets outraged, I know that they are now called Bratonias because they're ultimately an intergeneric cross between Brassia and Miltonia. So it makes sense. But why couldn't it be Miltasia, which is sort of more beautiful and poetic? Bratonia just sounds so cruel and unpleasant. So I am going to stick with Miltasia. See if I don't. So the only other care for this one is that it gets some direct sunlight in the morning, dappled morning light, not super fierce afternoon sun. And again, in winter, it gets a little afternoon direct sun, which is very mild and very gentle, and it loves it. And the flower, this one has a very peppery, spicy fragrance. Ah, oh, it's beautiful. And so I have to say, look at this plant, bang for buck, look at that. It's quite amazing. And all of those blooms, just a stunning, stunning plant. So that is why it is my number one favorite orchid to grow, because it's reliable. The blooms are really showy and gorgeous. It takes no particular special care. It's tough, nothing seems to eat it, <laughs> least of all me. And so I'm keen to find more, but unfortunately here in Australia, there isn't a huge variety of hybrids available, but I've got a couple of seedlings coming along, which hopefully will um, be old enough to bloom soon. So there we are, Rachel. My number one orchid for growing outdoors all year here in Melbourne is the Miltasia. What do you think of that? You know, this collab is really reminding me of all those great plants that I once grew and don't grow anymore. And I used to grow Miltasia Dark Star, which is a bit similar to your Lavender Kiss. Lavender Kiss is such a good name, by the way. Absolutely love that. I don't remember what happened to it, but what I ask myself now is why on earth I didn't replace it? And maybe that's something I really need to look at doing soon. Ah, well, I think you should replace it. Again, like Holcoglossums, I think these would do incredibly well in your conditions because they do so well in mine. And I feel there's a lot of crossover between what we can both grow. Well, Rachel, thank you so much for participating in this collaboration. It has been such fun seeing what your top five are and actually thinking about what mine are and having to whittle it down. Thank you to your viewers for hopping across and watching this video. And I look forward to us having the chance to collaborate on something else. And wouldn't it be wonderful if I was able to come to Ireland at some point, which I'd love to, as my grandfather was born in Athlone. So I'm keen to come. Matthew, you really are very kind. And I'm blushing from all the wonderful things you've said about my channel. Thank you. I loved doing this collab, but what I would love even more is if you could come to Ireland and we could do one in person. It would be such fun, wouldn't it? Thank you very much for joining me in this collab and inviting me onto your channel. And I just want to say goodbye to you and to your wonderful subscribers. And I wish you 
extensive blooming, blooming, multiple flowers and lots and lots of fantastic fragrance. Happy growing. Your orchids as ever are of course fabulous and thank you for your inspiration. As I said, it was your channel and your orchid videos that really got me started in the first place. So a million thanks to you. It has been such fun. And if you'd like to join me next week, do hit subscribe, I post every week, my continuing amateur adventures growing orchids here in Melbourne and Australia. So until then, thank you, Rachel, and goodbye. And I look forward to seeing you all next week for a further continuing amateur adventure.